Transmitter device activated. Coordinates set for Earth 2. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Earth 2 podcast, your weekly exploration of the DC Comics multiverse and the legacy of their Golden Age characters through the Silver and the Bronze Ages of comics. I'm petrified Peter Watson. And I'm David Startled Steel. Yes, it's Halloween week on the Earth 2 podcast. It's Halloween week everywhere. This week's episode, we're doing a little treat for you. It's technically counts as a flashback episode because the comic we're kind of hanging it on was published before an issue that we've already done of this book, but we'll get to that in a second. Indeed. Peter, what, what are we doing this week? Well, listeners, cast your mind back to our Fishy Buddies episode, mm. where we covered a story that started in the pages of Aquaman and was concluded in the pages of The Savage Submariner, an unofficial DC and Marvel crossover. Well, this episode is very much in the theme of that. Yes, although there's not a three-year gap between each <laughs> chapter of this, this crossover. No. This week's episode, listeners, is sponsored by the phenomenon that is the Rutland Halloween Parade. Rutland is in Vermont, which is a, a landlocked state, and I think in the, the northeast of America, I could be wrong. And famously, every year since 1959, it's had a big Halloween costume parade with floats and stuff and what well, have hey, you, and exciting. all that sort of thing. And following Roy Thomas's visit, to the parade in 1965, the parade occasionally started popping up in DC and Marvel Comics. Mm-hmm. So what we're doing today is Just League of America, issue 103, but also issue 207 of Thor and issue 16 of Amazing Adventures. Featuring the Beast. Yes, featuring the Beast. Because those three comics, like the Submariner story, share some characters and some elements. Mm-hmm. And some comic professionals who float between the three issues of Thor, JLA and Amazing Adventures encountering superheroes from different companies and taking their time getting to it and having fun and other stuff (laughs) at the Rutland Halloween Parade. Yes. Very exciting. Yes. But before we begin the stories properly, a little bit of further background. The first Marvel comic to feature the Rutland Parade was issue 83 of Avengers, published in October 1970. And this, as we say, Roy went there in 1965. He became friendly and was invited along again by the co-founder of the parade, a chap called Tom Fagan. Roy included Tom in Avengers 83 dressed as Nighthawk, who was obviously the closest equivalent to, you know, a Marvel version of Batman. Mm -hmm. Real life Tom had dressed as Batman ever since the parade in 1960, which was the first one that he'd really steered towards this, his dressed up superhero type theme. There's a lot more stuff about Rutland elsewhere. Listeners, we are not going to present you a full history of the Rutland parade. The information is out there. It's worth actually digging into. It's very, very interesting. But yeah, Avengers 83, the Masters of Evil, consisting of Claw, Whirlwind, the Melter and Radioactive Man, attack the parade in order to try and kidnap a prominent mathematician. This comic's notable because it was the first appearance of Valkyrie, even though she was the Enchantress in disguise at that point. Oh, okay. Issue 2 of Marvel Feature, published in October 1971, featuring the Defenders, again written by Roy Thomas, uses the parade as a backdrop, but beyond a couple of Marvel costumes and a couple of panels, there's not really... An awful lot worth mentioning for that one. But the first DC comic to feature the parade is the excellent story in issue 235 of Batman, Mm -hmm. published also in October 1971, a story called Night of the Reaper. Oh, yes. The story features Dick Grayson's visit to the parade with his college pals based on Bernie Wrightson, Alan Weiss and Jerry Conway. A highlight of this issue is a fantastic two-page spread of the parade drawn by Neil Adams where you can see attendees dressed as, amongst others, Batman, Man Bat, Batgirl, Hawkman, Captain America, Havoc, Captain Marvel, the real Captain Marvel, Superman, Aquaman, Solomon Grundy. And we later on we see people dressed as Thor, Invisible Girl, Doctor Doom and, and Spider-Man. It's an interesting story about the revenge of a former concentration camp prisoner and his Nazi tormentors. But again, it's really just a backdrop. It's an interesting story and very worth seeking out because it's it's really quite bleak. Um, the first page is like someone dressed up as Batman who's been impaled to a tree because <laughs> <laughs> the bad guys think that he was the real Batman. But again, it just uses the, the parade as a backdrop mm-hmm. to, to everything that's going on. Now, the stories we're going to cover in 1972 feature your actual Steve Englehart, mm-hmm. Jerry Conway and Len and Glynis Ween who are making their way to the Halloween party at the invitation of the aforementioned Tom Fagan. Now, the three stories are all published within a week or two of each other, and you could read them all in different orders and get different experiences. One panel in one story makes a reference to something that happens in another panel in another story, but then the first one shows events happening before events happening in another comic. So if you read them all in one, if you read them all one after the other, you'd get the gist of what was happening. So what I've elected to do today 
is walk us through amazing adventures, first of all, and then through Thor, and then finally into Justice League 103. And it's worth doing, we think, because it's another DC and Marvel crossover, a little bit more implicit Mm -hmm. and a little bit more condensed than the, the aforementioned Fishy Bodies one. Good stuff. We're going to begin, listeners, with Amazing Adventures issue 16, published on the 17th of October 1972. Now, this is that interesting period when the X-Men didn't have their own comic. Yes. And they were, only, they were sort of reduced to popping up occasionally, but the Beast had his own strip in Amazing Adventures for, for a while. We would refer you to the Danger Room podcast if you want a good X-Men podcast recommendation. Peter, would you like to tell everyone about the cover to Amazing Adventures issue 16? It has the Amazing Adventures logo up the top, which isn't really much of a logo, to be honest. It says featuring the Beast. Now, that's a logo. That's very good. It's very scary. Yellow letters with lovely red highlights. It's very cool. We have... The Juggernaut! He's back! And he is fighting the Beast. Now, the Beast has transformed from the previous fun-loving Hank McCoy into a furry, blue character who's more beast-like, one would say. This is that period where he's gone through that transformation for the first time. Yes. It's very exciting, very cool. And this confrontation is happening on top of a roof. Gosh. And looking up from below... We have what appears to be the Vision, Iron Man, Invisible Woman, Spider-Man, Thor, and Captain America. Wouldn't she be an Invisible Girl at that point? Yeah, but it's fine. <laughs> oh, Smash right. patriarchy. Yeah, okay, right, fair enough. And the Juggernaut is saying, Your strength could never match the Juggernaut. You were doomed from the start. And there's a caption at the bottom that says, One, One must die in the dark of Halloween. Very exciting. Mm -hmm. Very exciting. So, listeners, don't worry, we're not going to do a full read. We're going to read some of it, though. Amazing Adventures begins with Jerry Conway, Steve Englehart and Lennon Glynis Ween on their way to the Rutland Parade. They're in Steve's car when suddenly a massive blue furry figure appears on the road in front of them. And that takes us to the top of page two where we see the beast running away from the road up into the surrounding woods. Everyone gets out of the car, Steve Englehart says, What in the world was that? And Len Ween says... I don't know. Some kind of animal man or or Marion or... I don't know. Glennis has got out of the car and she says... Wow, Len, for a second I knew how Fay Ray must have felt. Which Len says... Hold it, Glennis. If I have to fly by planes to be with you up here, we're going back to Queens. And at this, Jerry Conway says... By planes might be better than this rattletrap of Steve's. As far as getting us to Tom Fagan's party in time... Jerry doesn't sound happy, does he? And then Steve says... Listen, Jerry, my car's okay, but after seeing that thing... I've become entirely unenthused about our being here. Of course, we know the big blue furry guy's Hank McCoy, a.k.a. the Beast, who quickly puts on his human disguise and collects his pal Vera and heads back to the road, and the two of them beg a lift from Mr. Englehart and the others. As the car moves off, a dimensional portal disgorges the juggernaut from his cosmic prison. We won't go into details on that, but it involves Doctor Strange and Eternity. We're now going to read from the top of page six. With the car spluttering and making lots of noises, you'll find out why it's making these noises when we read issue 207 of Thor. The car is pulling up outside a motel. From inside the car, Jerry says, Are we there yet? Can't hear you, Jer. Car's making too much racket. Car pulls to a halt. Panel 2, everyone falls out, with Glennis saying, Len, I'm telling you, I knew we should have come up with Mike Friedrich. Honestly, this Mustang's a disgrace. Doesn't Marvel pay Steve anything? And she seems to <laughs> deliberately have grabbed... Len, to cover up his mouth there as he exclaims, oomph, and then Glennis continues, Sorry, Len, dear, didn't mean to jab you with my knee. Hank and Vera have also got out of the car. Vera says, Heavens, Henry, I didn't remember your shoulders being so wide. Clean living does it every time. To which Englehart says, Couldn't your life have been a little dirtier? Englehart looks glad to get rid of them in the next panel, to be honest. It's done outside the motel, he says, We're going to toss our stuff in here and head on over to Fagan's house. We'd ask you all along, but... You need an invitation to get in. Sorry. To which Hank McCoy says, That's okay, we're not staying in Rutland anyway. Later on, Hank and Vera bump into Steve, Jerry, Len and Glennis. Glennis now wearing a costume based on Supergirls. The parade has started and we see costumes based on Flash and Batman before another portal opens, dropping Juggernaut into one of the floats. He smashes up the superhero float before vanishing and declaring that he'll be back and for longer each time the closer it gets to midnight. So we're now going to read page 8, panels 1 to 3. So amongst the chaos of the superhero parade being smashed up, Steve Englehart observes, Far freaking out! Now I see how you can get off on floats! Vera looks around at this point and notices that someone's missing. She says, Hey, wait a minute, gang! Where's Glynis? To which Hank says, She was just here. 
Len is immediately distraught. He cries, Glynis! Glyn! And he runs off. They all run off to look for her with Vera saying, Could she have been hurting the Malay? To which Hank says, Quick, spread out and search for her. Len Wien says, You don't have to tell me, man. That's my wife. The bulk of the next few pages are then taken up with the beast's battle with the juggernaut before Hank knocks him off a cliff and makes his way to Tom Fagan's party. Tom is dressed as Nighthawk, remember that for when we get to JLA 103, but there's a clear Superman logo on one costume and we see others based on Cyclops, Scarlet Witch and Spider-Man. Just as Hank starts to catch his breath, the juggernaut bursts through the wall of Tom's house, having followed Hank's emanations, apparently. Another fight follows, during which the Beast manages to remove Juggernaut's helmet. And we see Len and Steve still searching for Glynis, as Steve notes that the Juggernaut is going to try and steal his car. The Beast, however, knocks Juggernaut out of the vehicle, and the effect of Juggernaut's helmet being taken off catches up with him, and he starts to age rapidly before being drawn into another portal. And as Juggernaut vanishes, the caption reads, Then the Beast is alone. Terribly alone. Alone in a world full of strangers. We see Len and Jerry and Steve and Glenn who's returned. We see that Glennis is wearing her costume which is clearly based on Supergirl. Len says, but where were you, Glenn? I I really don't remember, but I think I had a good time. To which Jerry Conway says, well, we've had a terrible time running around looking for you. Don't do it again. Really, Jerry? You make such a big deal out of everything. Halloween's a night for cutting loose and having fun. Behind them, the beast lopes quietly into the towering forest and stands until dawn in the cold, cold dark, alone. And the caption reads, The The end. end. Yes, take a drink because we see Hank the Beast standing in front of a very large full moon. So that's Amazing Adventures 16. On the way to the parade, they picked up Hank. So we now move to issue 207 of Thor. So Peter, would you like to tell everyone about the cover of issue 207 of Thor that was published on 10th of October 1972? Yes, we have the Mighty Thor logo at the top. Above that is the Marvel Comics group banner. Six pence it costs, because we're reading from <laughs> yes. uh, the UK one, which is actually a first printing, folks. Yes, all these naysayers who say, I, I say the nay, <laughs> to the fact that UK comics are reprints. They're not. They're actually the first ones off the printing press. So there you go. So they could get sent over here. So they're actually uh, more valid first printings than sense copies. Mm. They don't fact fans. Anyway, sorry, enough of that. It's a special haunted Halloween issue, it says. We have Thor. He's being beset upon by a kind of a grey wolfen creature in, yes. in the back. Loki is approaching him with a sword bursting with energy. And he's saying, Satan, Diablo, strike in the name of Loki. And at the bottom of the page, we have a caption that says, Where, Where demons, demons dwell. dwell. Looks like Gil Kane to me. Very Gil Kane, yes. It looks like Gil Kane to me. So, now bear in mind what I'm saying about simultaneous action listeners and stuff going on and all that sort of thing. Our opening splash, Stan Lee presents the Mighty Thor, a, a logo for the story that reads, Fire Sword. And a caption that follows, Once they called it All Hallows Eve, the night of all saints, all souls. These days it goes by another name, perhaps a touch more colloquial. Halloween in the town of Rutland, second largest city in the sovereign state of Vermont. And we see a float filled with superheroes. We see costumes based on Quicksilver, Black Panther, Thor. (laughs) Amusingly, he has a dark moustache. Yes. Scarlet Witch, a very loose-fitted vision. Captain America, Iron Man, clearly some people based on... Spider-Man and Doctor Doom, and also a couple of guys clearly based on Superman and Batman. Down the front right-hand corner of this opening splash panel, we see none other than our pals Steve Englehart, Jerry Conway, Len Wein and Glynis Wein. Englehart is saying, Looks like Jerry told us true, people. We're going to have a good time. And after the ride up here, I can sure use it. In the first panel of page two, Len says, You and me both, Steve. I'm so tense I could punch something. To which Jerry says, Don't get violent, Len. Tom Fagan's expecting us. Then let's move. My buggy's still got wheels, even if it has lost a muffler or two. Ladies first, Glynis, you can sit next to me. Englehart opens the door of the car, gestures for Glynis to get in, and this prompts Len to say, How'd you like a broken arm, friend? Just kidding, Len. Sure you were, says Glynis. In the next panel, with some bracks and verums and lots and lots of smoke, the car roars off. From inside, Jerry says, Hey, Steve, 
Are you sure this isn't illegal? Trust me, Jerry, trust me. It's only a few miles to Fagin's place, and if we don't meet any more beasts, we should make it in five minutes. I hope. And a little asterisk takes us to a caption that reads, See Amazing Adventure 16, on sale now. Roy. Yep, that's what I was saying about how we see different, the same events in different order and all sorts of stuff. But anyway, mm. the caption for the next panel reads... Twenty minutes later, after a brief brush with the local constabulary, four weary figures make their way up a lonely moonlit path. Bear that in mind, listeners. The brief brush with the local constabulary. Watch out for that. Before them, the house. Yep, we see Englehart and Glenis and the others walking up the hill towards... And within... And the door is answered by Tom Fagan in his Nighthawk costume. Tom says... Jerry, Len, Glynis, Steve. Glad you could make it, all of you. Come in, won't you? To which Jerry says, Tom, is something wrong? Your eyes. Just the light, only the light. Come in, we were just getting ready to leave. For the parade, you know. And as everyone walks in, we again see some more superhero influence costumes, uh, an Iron Man, another Vision, Captain America with a moustache, which is very alarming, not in a good way, and Doctor Doom. And then the first panel of page three, Lane looks a bit suspicious and says, I just know how silly this is going to sound, but something about Tom bothers me. I felt it too, Len. He seemed so distant. Says Glynis, and then Jerry says, It's probably nerves. Wait till after the parade. You'll see. And what we don't know at this point, listeners, is that Fagin is under the influence of none other than Loki. <gasps> Thor and Lady Sif arrive and have a long fight with the Absorbing Man, culminating in an earthquake caused by Crusher, striking the ground after touching Thor's hammer. We now return to story page 8. And we see that Glynis, Len, Jerry and Steve are sat around a table, getting stuck into some munchies. Glynis says, A little snack before the parade? That, that's the fourth burger you've had since we came in here, Len. And Steve says, What's the rush, Glynis? They still have to repair the floats. Let the man eat. Which Len says, Peasants. And a footnote reminds us about the, you know, the floats were damaged in the pages of Amazing Adventures issue 16. Jerry says in the next panel, Look, we've been here for an hour already. Obviously we can't stay here all night. We can't, says Len. And then he says, What's so funny, Glyn? Who's laughing and she says, I just thought of you in those tights, dressed up as Morbius, and that awful ripping when you... <laughs> Glynis stands up the next panel, moves away from the table as Len says, Yeah, well, what's so hard about your costume, wife? Whoever heard of Power Girl anyhow? And we can see that, again, this is Glynis's clearly based Supergirl costume that we saw at the end of Amazing Adventure 16, but instead of an S over the left breast pocket, it's a little G. Jerry looks at Glenn and says, Don't listen to him, Glenn. My old roommate's got rotten taste. He married me, didn't he? And the caption for the next panel reads, Several hamburgers and a malt for Jerry later. Glenn must have gone to the bathroom, I reckon, because Len is looking at his watch and saying, Hey, she's been in there 20 minutes. You think something's wrong? This prompts Jerry to say, Better ask one of the waitresses to take a look. How many times can you powder your nose? The answer to that question must go the way of other less memorable inquiries for... Yeah, a waitress emerges from the ladies' room saying, I'm sorry, sir, there's no one inside. To which Englehart says, Maybe she went on ahead, Len. Len looks very pensive as he says, Ah, uh -uh, guys, not Glenn. Something's happened to her. I can feel it. We've got to find her. We've got to. To which Conway says, Don't worry, Len, we will. We return to Thor's battle with the Absorbing Man. It continues for a while, but concludes when Creel falls into some water and seems to dissolve after absorbing its qualities. Gasp. No rest for Thor, though, as he's then set upon by Loki and his twin hounds, Satan and Diablo. Thor gets rid of them by creating a whirlwind. Loki has used the Absorbing Man to lure Thor to Rutland. He has hypnotised Tom Fagan and plans to use the souls of the people of Rutland to fuel his titular Fire Sword. Fire sword that we described with the logo at the start. We'll probably put that panel on the socials. Thor defeats Loki by summoning a lightning storm, and Loki is struck by lightning and rendered blind. The final page of the story has a little caption that reads epilogue, and then another caption that reads On a lonely road near Tom Fagan's rambling mansion, a voice cries out as Engelhart yells, My car! Blasted! Some dude stealing my car! Why didn't you guys stop him? Yep, there's a brack and a caroom and a brack as this vehicle, which is in such a poor condition, limps off. And Len replies to Steve, With what, Steve? Bad breath? And then Glenn appears and she says, Len? Len, is that you? Glynis! Englehart says in the next panel, Get to the reunions later, people. What are we going to do about my car? Which Len says, Five to one, the cops stop it because of the bad muffler, Steve. 
And then Engelhart points and says, That guy in the Loki costume. Yeah, we should see that there's an awful lot of rain coming down. There's a lot, a lot of mist and fog, and it looks as though <laughs> they're all standing perilously close to a cliff edge. Oh dear. Um, the car is speeding along, and Loki gets in the way of the car, saying, Wait, stop! Whoever thou art, stop! He continues in the next panel, I do need thine aid! I command thee to stop! And we hear the bracks and rooms as the vehicle roars past, and Loki again yells, I command thee, stop! Uh Uh-oh, Jerry says, Did you see that? He went over the cliff as though he couldn't see it. He must have been following the sounds of the car. And then Glynis says, Len, I think I'm beginning to remember. Hold me, Len, please. And that's all (laughs) for issue 207 of Thor. Are you following it all so far, listeners? (laughs) (laughs) Peter isn't. Here we are. And so now, we arrive at the main event, issue 103 of the Just League of America, also published on 10th of October 1972. Peter's going to tell you about the cover. Yes, very striking cover. We have the DC logo in the top left, 20 cents top right. Still approved by the Comics Code Authority. The world's greatest superheroes, Justice League of America. Shield at the top. Yep, once again in the Partick Thistle colours, which I like to see. Mm -hmm. Then on the left-hand side, we have some of the roll call for this issue, including Superman. Batman. The Flash. Green Lantern. Hawkman. Green Arrow. But the main image, the main image of this cover, there's a grave, an open grave. There's a headstone that says R.I.P. Superman, Batman, Flash, Green Lantern, Hawkman, Green Arrow, and Black Canary at the bottom. (gasps) Gasp. And some of those assembled leaguers are around the grave. Hawkman, Green Lantern, Superman, Batman, Flash, and Green Arrow. But hovering, hovering over the grave, we have a ghostly almost spectral figure holding the spade or shovel that dug this grave. And this figure is saying, It is the stroke of midnight. I have come for you. And yes, folks, it's the Earth 2 podcast debut of The Phantom Can Stranger. You, Phantom Stranger. Can you remember the first time you encountered The Phantom Stranger? Uh, yes, I think it was in a DC Comics Presents story. Okay. Yeah, uh, where he turns up. Yeah, uh, I think it might be the one that the Joker's in as well. All oh, right. Yeah, another one you mean. I think that might be the first yeah, one. Yeah, huh? two. Yeah, we huh? might actually do that one, listeners, because mm-hmm. it features another dimension. Stay tuned. It certainly does. I love the Phantom Strain. He's one of my favourite characters of all time. I think the first time I met him was that issue of GLA when the Atom gets married. Oh, of course. Yeah. I've got a feeling that's when I met a lot of folk. Mm-hmm. And he's one of these characters that I, I remember imprinting on me a lot when I was a kid, but I can never really articulate why because I don't think I read that many comics with him in. But I remember him turning up in Legends and being a big part of that when that mm-hmm. immediate post crisis yeah, sort of thing was yeah. happening. So the Phantom Stranger is his ongoing book at this point. Um, we have a vague plan to do one issue of it because Peter has an idea of why. So we'll get mm-hmm. to that before too long. Good, good. We're going to do most of issue 103 of Justice League. We'll see how we get on. So the opening page of this epic Halloween story, made up of four panels. The first panel is very like the sort of intro panels that you get for the Phantom Stranger in his own comic around this time. Marvellous shot of the Phantom Stranger standing on a windswept hillside at night, looking very moody and intense and saying, What makes a man a champion? Is it powers and abilities far beyond those of other mortals? Or is it the knowledge that the cause one fights for is righteous and just? Men call me the Phantom Stranger. And I come this time to seek an answer. Are true champions born, or are they made? A late October night tide on a shadowed crossroads outside quiet Rutland, Vermont, as a curious crowd mills about impatiently. Yeah, quite a large crowd. It looks like two crowds separated on either side of this crossroads. More leaves blowing about. There's a hooded figure with a stick standing directly in the middle of this intersection. And a couple of people at the front of one of the large groups of people says... I'm still not sure why you dragged me out here, Tom. Hang on a minute, Marty, and you will. The ceremony is about to start. The second chap to speak points at a clock tower in the distance in panel three, saying, When the old clock tower tolls midnight, tis said old Mistress Sarah speaks to the spirits, and they tell her dark secrets in return. The names of those who are to die within twenty-four hours. Then, as it has for years, the ritual begins. With each chilling peal of the clock, a name is chanted. A warrant of death that is lost in the mind. And in the larger panel four, we see the figure at the heart of the intersection of the crossroads. It's a very... (sighs) I'm getting a real sort of Macbeth witch vibe. Yes, yes, very much so. Woman, Mm. very gnarled looking, bent over, using a bit of a branch as a walking stick. And as the clock starts to chime, she says... 
With each bell tolled, these names I say of those who'll die by end of day. Superman. Flash. Hawkman. Green Lantern. Batman. Green Arrow. And as the wind blows loose leaves past her, we see the looming shadow of the Phantom Stranger. Oh, gasp. And what of those six men, condemned by a whisper, those six staunch defenders who formed the backbone of the world's greatest crime-fighting organization? Let's shift our attention to a gleaming satellite, whirling 22,300 miles above Earth's emerald face and sea. Condemned by a whisper, supported menswear <laughs> at Birmingham Foundry in 1996 or something. I'm just making up <laughs> random names now. So yes, inside the satellite, Superman, Green Lantern, Green Arrow, Hawkman and the Flash are already there. And Batman is beaming in. Green Arrow, chirpy and cheerful as usual, is saying, About time you got here, Batman. The rest of us have been waiting an hour. Sorry, Green Arrow, but I was wrapping up a junk-dealing ring and took longer than I figured. He all sat down. Hawkman with his gavel bangs on the table, saying, Well, since the other members are still on Earth too, helping the seven soldiers of victory adjust to the world of the present, I call this emergency meeting to order. And a little footnote reminds us to check issues 100 to 102 of GLA for the details about the seven soldiers arriving in the present, or as Peter always likes to say at this point, the previous episodes of our podcast. If you haven't <laughs> listened to them, they're a treat. The pure R, etc. And I'm not even biased because I'm in them. <laughs> anyway, Hawkman continues. Why did you summon us here, Batman? Batman looks a bit surprised in the next panel, saying, Me? I didn't summon anyone. I thought one of you did. And Queen Lantern says, None of us. Since you arrived late, we just naturally assumed... And off camera, a voice says in the final panel, But you assumed incorrectly, Green Lantern. The Batman did not summon you all here. I did. The heroes whirl around looking surprised. Superman exclaims, Who? And a figure in a long cloak, with a hat, hooding his eyes, and a nice big fancy medallion, and a nice amazing 70s style polo neck, appears from the shadows and says, My name is not important, Superman, but my mission is. Unless you heed what I say, your world will end when the witching hour tolls once more. A gnarled old woman on a country crossroads? A black cloak wanderer who goes where no one else possibly could? How do these two mysterious characters fit into the bizarre puzzle that will soon confront the Justice League of America? Come, follow the world's greatest heroes to the shadowed hillsides of New England if you dare. Join the most astonishing celebration of all time as... A stranger, a stranger walks among, among us. And another caption tells us... This is a Halloween holocaust conjured up by Len Wein writer, Dick Dillon and Dick Giordano artist, Julius Schwartz editor. Green Arrow gets to his feet in the first panel of page four saying, Look, I don't know how you breached our security services, pal, but you and your ghost story are going out of here and you're... Hold it, G.A. I know this man. We'd better listen to what he has to say. Ollie sits back down in panel two saying... Okay, Doomsayer, the Batman just brought you three minutes. You better use them well. Quiet, Archer. Let the man speak. Thank you, Hawkman, says the stranger. I'll be brief. I've come here to do something I find most unusual, gentlemen. I've come to ask for your help. There is an evil afoot on a land, so awesome, so overpowering, that I fear I cannot combat it alone. The stranger crosses to a map of the East Coast of America, and he continues... Today is October 31st, Halloween, a day for dark things to wander the earth. And it is here, in the city called Rutland, Vermont, that those unholy entities will cross the Black Gate and gain life once more. Green Arrow tips his cap back, looking a bit sceptical. Final panel, saying, Sounds heavy, but just how do those ghosties figure to sneak across? Somebody slip him a pass key? In a manner of speaking, Green Arrow, someone will. They're being summoned to Earth as servants of someone you know quite well, Felix Faust. In the first panel of page five, Superman looks thoughtful and says, Faust? But he's still in prison. I put him there myself. The cell holds only an ethereal illusion, Superman. A simple trick for one of Faust's mystic skills. And now, gentlemen, since you know all you need to know, I will take my leave. The stranger turns on his heel, walks away. Green Lantern gets to his feet and says, One minute, friend. We're not done with you yet. 
A power ring prison will delay your departure until we are done. He conjures a big green cone with his power ring, which drops down over the stranger. Batman says, I wouldn't be too sure of that, GL. Hal replies, What is that supposed to mean, Batman? Take a peek under that ice cream cone of yours and see for yourself. In panel four, GL raises the power ring cone and the stranger's vanished. GL says, What? He, he's gone, but how? Nobody can get in or out of this satellite without passing more security precautions than they have at Fort Knox, says the Flash, to which Batman says, He can. Maybe that's why he's known as the Phantom Stranger. In the next panel, Green Arrow says, So, Dark Eyes is a spook. So what? Where does that leave us? As long as you keep exercising your mouth, Archer, it leaves us nowhere. Hawkman's right, says the Flash. We'd better consider our actions. And whilst all this is going on, Superman is studying the map on the wall. In the final panel of page five, he says, What's to consider? Where Felix Faust is, we'd better be too. Fellas, I think we'll do our trick-or-treating in Rutland this year. And he points firmly at Rutland, Vermont, on the map. And we see actually how helpful this is actually for non-Americans like Pete and I. We can see that New York and Syracuse and Rochester and Lake Ontario are all highlighted as well. Yes. Very, very interesting. Every day in education. Yep. All good for improving our American geography when it comes to the Let's Pages now. If you've been paying attention to the earlier segments, when we detailed the chunks from Amazing Adventures in Thor, you'll remember that Jerry Conway, Steve Englehart and Len and Glynis Wayne were making their way to Rutland, Vermont for the Halloween parade. And we saw several parts of their journey, both to and from, and some of the things that happened when they got there. You may remember them discussing part of Steve's car falling off. Well, in a wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey type way, here we go with the caption for the first panel of page six. The stage is set, but our cast is not yet complete. We find the remaining four players on a lonely Vermont roadside late the same afternoon. Glennis and Len are standing next to the car as Steve and Jerry carry a big, hefty... I'm not a motorist, I'm not a driver, I don't know what you call it. But very helpfully, Steve tells us what this piece of, I don't want to say equipment, this part of the machine is called when he says... I don't believe it, the whole freaking muffler fell off. Len looks very much like John Nathan Turner on this page (laughs) and says... Steve, I told you this crate wouldn't last all the way to Rutland. It's the story of my life. We'll never get to Fagan's on time at this rate. And then Jerry says, I'm still not sure I even want to go to Fagan's, Len. After all the hassles I had at the party there last year, then Asterisk reminds us to take a look at... Night of the Reaper, Batman 237. Which we mentioned earlier on, obviously, when Jerry was at the, the party with none other than Dick Grayson. In the next panel, Glynis says... Garbage! If you didn't want to come, Jerry, you wouldn't be here. Besides, you're the one who convinced us what a great time we'd have. Wait a minute, says Len. Squabbling isn't going to get us anywhere. Save your energy for the parade, Glynis. Considering the Supergirl costume you'll be wearing, you'll need all the energy you get to keep warm. They'll climb back into the car with Engelhart saying, Hey, don't hassle my car, people. It's trying to get us to the parade. And it will, if we don't let it sit too long. And... With lots of brooms and clanks and blats and bracks and noises and general noises and general mayhem, the car pulls off and the Phantom Stranger's shadow watches them go. As from inside the car, Englehart says, Boy, will Tom Fagan be surprised when he sees us? We arrive at the top of page seven. The afternoon dwindles swiftly as the world's greatest heroes scour the placid Vermont countryside in search of things unworldly and inhuman. Yep, we see Superman flying overhead using his telescopic vision. Green Lantern generating a a cracking pair of power ring binoculars. Never thought I'd say that on a Wednesday morning. Hawkman and some of his feathered friends ranging about and the Flash doing some very, very discreet super speed vibrating and snooping as well. Caption for panel two. Until as dusk begins to fall. Yes, we've seen this a lot about comics at this point, but the colouring is beautiful. This Mm -hmm. is a, a, a stunning sort of early evening sky that we've got standing behind us. Green Arrow, Batman, Green Lantern, Flash, Hawkman and Superman all assemble. Green Arrow saying, Struck out, didn't you? Like rookies in the Little League GA, says Green Lantern. And then the Flash says, How could we succeed when we're not even sure we're searching for? I'm not sure I'd recognise the demon if I tripped over one. The next panel, Superman says, Flash is right. If there is something haunting this area, our superpowers can't detect it. And a crouching Hawkman looks very thoughtful and says, I agree, Superman. What we need here is a Base of operations, a place we can use to plan our next moves. Batman moves off in the next panel, saying, And I think I know just the spot. Follow me, chums. You're in for a surprise. A slow dissolve. We arrive at the top of page eight. 
several miles distant, on the outskirts of the town. And we see Tom Fagan, now dressed as Batman, not Nighthawk like he was earlier. He's got a piece of wood and a hammer on his hand. He must be doing some more repairs or something or other. And he sees a very noisy car arriving, to which he says, Some more late arrivals. It's, hey, Len, Glynis, Jerry, Steve, how are you? Glad you could make it. And from inside the car, Len Wayne cries, So are we, Tom. Panel two, the car's ground to a halt. They all get out of the vehicle. Don't make any mention of having seen any blue furry members of the X-Men or anything at this (laughs) point, but we know that they did. Mm Mm-hmm. Len is saying, Steve's car is falling apart by degrees, but, but we'd have been here if we had to come by ox cart. Which would probably have been more comfortable anyway, says Glynis. Tom says, I know what you mean. Still, I'm pleased you accepted my invitation. And off camera, a voice says, Does that invitation hold for us, Tom? Tom whirls around in surprise and says, Who? Oh my gosh! And we see the assembled six members of the Justice League of America. Batman says, Happy Halloween, Tom. It's... Good to see you again. And impatient as always, Green Arrow cuts in with, Save the salutations, pal, and ask the man a question. What Green Arrow is trying to get across in his own inept way is, Can we stick around here for a little while? To which Tom says, A a a little while? You can stay here forever if you want. But since you are here, well, there's a favour we'd like to ask. Just name it, Tom, and if it's within our power... A cool bit here as Len turns to his wife and whispers, Julie will never believe me when I tell him about this. We're back to the other conversation as Tom is saying, You see, we have this parade every year where we honour you guys, and, well, since you're here in the flesh, we thought that maybe you'd, well... And Batman looks to the others and says, I think I catch your drift, Tom, and I think I know what our answer is. A tiny caption tells us we're continued in the second page following. We pass an advertisement for three big drafting kits and for sea monkeys. Hey. And then we come to the glorious... Splash panel, that is page nine. To some, thirteen is an unlucky number, boding misfortune and evil designs. To others, it is a charm, a symbol to be conjured with. Perhaps it is neither, perhaps it is both. On this bright night it matters little indeed. For this is the night of Rutland's thirteenth annual Halloween parade, and on its bustling crowd-covered streets, that number stands for... Excitement! There is a lot going on in this panel. Fireworks going off in the background. Green Lantern flying overhead, projecting a float for his JLE colleagues to stand on. Batman in the middle, with his arms spread wide. Superman and Flash to either side of him. Green Arrow and Hawkman hanging on at the side. We can see the crowds all watching. There's another float behind, which seems to be struck by a Shazam lightning bolt, with someone dressed as the original Captain Marvel standing on it. And we can also see people dressed as the Incredible Hulk, what looks like Mm Spider-Man, Supergirl... What looks like, it looks like Shiny Knight, but it's probably Thor. Someone who looks very much like the Robin of Earth 2. And mm-hmm. someone else who, if we look closely, is dressed in blue, has a large white star on his chest and appears to have a red disc on his back. Mm. I wonder who that could be. Yes. Bear in mind what we said about Glynis Ween having a supergirl costume. So the first panel of page 10 is captioned. As the cheerful procession winds its way through town. Quite a feeling, isn't it, Batman? To know so many people respect and admire you, says Superman. Maybe, but... I'm never sure of its respect they feel for me, or fear. Hawkman says in panel two. Hey, did you fellows hear something odd? Maybe it's my imagination, but... Blistering buzzards! Look behind us! And our point of view shifts in panel three. As Green Lantern, Batman and Flash turn round, and Flash observes... The other floats! They're gone! Vanished! But the crowd's still cheering as if nothing had happened, says Green Lantern, and Batman says... Well, we were looking for something strange, and by... God, we found it! In the next panel, we see a couple of the bystanders, one of whom looks like our pal Len Wein, seem to be frozen as they look on. Superman is saying, Amazing! The entire assembly is completely entranced. Faust handiwork, no doubt, says the Flash. Green Arrow, waving a hand in front of one of the crowd to try and distract them, says, Man, I've seen people stone before, but this is ridiculous. Archer, your sense of humour is sickening. Listen, Featherface! I have just about enough of you. Easy, Arrow. We have more important things to deal with right now, says Green Lantern, getting between Ollie and Carter as they start to square up. In the foreground, Batman says, I suggest we split up and scour the countryside. We'll find our answers when we find those floats. Moments later, two swiftly moving figures scout the dense Vermont woodland. Flash and Hawkman are speeding along. Flash on the ground, Hawkman flying overhead. Flash says, Friend to friend, Carter, why do you keep putting Green Arrow down the way you do? 
I really wish I knew Flash. There's just something about the man that irritates me. He... Flash interrupts, saying, Hang on, Hawkman. I hear something. I'll go on ahead. Check it out. Hey, wait for me. Caption for panel three reads, But the Scarlet Speedster is already out of hearing range, threading its way through the brush, blinding velocity, until... Yes, Flash is almost tripped up. There's a swish sound effect, and then a bang sound effect, as a red, white, and blue, with a star at the centre of it, shield, bounces off the ground between his feet. Ah, says the Flash. The modern Mercury staggers to his feet to find himself facing... Three of the parade goers dressed as Supergirl, Adam Strange, and... And this figure, who is clearly based on Captain America, replies, Commando America, at your service. Now, I've seen this panel out of context many times over the years. I've seen it shared on tweets and Facebook groups and all this sort of stuff, and it's very interesting to see it actually properly in context. And we see that these three cosplayers of their time are surrounded by golden glow, and we can only assume that this is indeed Lennis Wien in her Supergirl costume. All very interesting. Adam Strange looks very baggy. Yes. <laughs> The older, really? Yeah. yeah. I don't know if he's got any lines. Let's get Arian on the phone. Anyway, in the next panel, the Captain America guy says, Quickly, friends, we must do as our master commands. Flash and Hawkman must be destroyed. Hawkman is arriving in the scene in the background of this panel. can see his silhouette in the distance. As Supergirl and Adam Strange take to the air, the Flash thinks, Batman was right. We found our answers. Over the next couple of pages, the Flash is chased by the Adam Strange cosplayer, who tries to zap Flash with his ray gun. Barry stops him by throwing a punch at high speed which knocks out Adam with a stream of compressed air. But Commando America takes Flash out from behind with a shield. The Commando moves in for the kill, but Hawkman distracts him by summoning a small flock of birds. Hawkman then moves on to tackle the false Supergirl, but she grabs his badge from his chest, damaging his flight controls and making him fall to the ground. As this happens, her blonde Supergirl wig falls off, and we can see that it is indeed Glynis Wayne. Uh Uh-oh! Stunned, Flash and Hawkman look up at the glowing figures of Commando America. They are sat Supergirl and they are sat Adam Strangers. Commando America says, We have done as commanded. Now we return to the Master. The glow brightens and increases as the Flash says, They're fading away and I'm too weak to stop them. Can't move. Feel weak. Something's wrong. We need help, says Hawkman. In the final panel of page 13, a familiar figure looms out of the darkness. Flash smiles and says, we have help, Hawkman. Look! The, the Phantom Stranger! Over here, friend! Quickly! We need you! The caption for the first panel on page 14 reads, But amazingly, the black-cloaked wanderer ignores the two sprawled heroes, pauses only for an instant to retrieve something from the matted forest floor, then is gone again into the shadows. Yes, with his cape twirling down on the ground, a helpless Hawkman calls after him. Stranger, help us, please! Help us! And soon, all is silent. While elsewhere... A slow dissolve and we see none other than Felix Faust. Have we had him on the podcast before? Yes, he was one of the crime champions. Of course, JLA 2122. Mm-hmm. So it's the first time he's appeared since. I believe so. Wow. Welcome back, Felix. Yes. Gosh, do I try and assemble a Felix Faust cover gallery <laughs> in, this, in his honour? I don't know. Felix is standing in front of a very low, wide cauldron green smoke billowing from it and he's conjuring images in the smoke and we see the faces of Batman, the Flash, Green Lantern and Hawkman. Interesting. Felix is saying, Splendid! Things go according to schedule exactly. Two Justice Leaguers down and four more to go. This will be a most enjoyable evening indeed. Elsewhere, Batman and Green Lantern team up to deal with the guy in a Spider-Man costume before someone dressed as Thor, not the real Thor, we know he's elsewhere, turns up and knocks out Green Lantern with his hammer. Batman trips Thor up with his bat rope, before he in turn is knocked out by a glowing, giggling figure dressed as Robin. And the caption then for the first panel of page 17 reads, Haunting laughter still on their lips, the demon-infested forms fade swiftly away, and then... Batman is on the ground, and this panel framed by a pair of smart shoes and some smart trousers. Batman looks up at this figure and says, Help us. I I feel so weak. Something draining my life force. You you must help. Please. This figure remains silent. We see his hand reaching down to the ground. And then in panel three, the phantom stranger walks off into the distance with Green Lantern and Batman unconscious behind him. We cut back to Felix Faust. Four have fallen and little time remains. Unless all six Justice Leaguers perish at the stroke of midnight, 
my outworld demons will be forced to return whence they came. And I wouldn't want that to happen. No, I wouldn't like that at all. Elsewhere, three recently entranced visitors to the Green Mountain State pause for the briefest of moments. And we see Len Wayne, Steve Englehart, who seems taller than he's been in every other <laughs> appearance so far, and Jerry Conway, who seems shorter and more smartly dressed. Len is obviously preoccupied, he says. I can't understand where Glynis disappeared to, Englehart says. Don't look at me, Len. That's some strange lady you've got. And Jerry says, she's obviously not in town. Let's head back to Fagin's place. Maybe she wandered over there. Obviously, you remember from the tail end of Thor that Glynis had disappeared at one point. They weren't quite sure where she was, so now we know. We arrive at the top of page 18. While still elsewhere, a land-shattering battle is well underway. Yes, now if you remember my description of the, the floats earlier in the comic, one of the people at the party was dressed as the original Captain Marvel, the Big Red Cheese, who at this point has yet to properly appear. In the DC Comics universe. Yes. Still, at this point, still a, a month or so away, maybe six, seven weeks away from the publication mm -hmm. of Shazam issue one, but because yep. we are, this is a flashback episode of sorts to time it with Halloween, we've already met the original Captain Marvel. Indeed, yes. So what's going on in the first panel of page 18? Well, the glowing figure of the Ersatz original Captain Marvel has punched Superman into a rocky wall, saying... The master commands me to destroy you, and destroy you I will. Rubbing his chin, Superman pulls himself out. Looks like actually it's like a cliff wall or something. He pulls himself out, gets to his feet, and he thinks, that big cheese is as powerful as I am, almost. Better show him who's number one before he gets too big for his britches. Gosh, all the, all the subtext there, listeners. In panel three, we see Green Arrow watching the fight going on between Supes and the fake Captain Marvel, observing, that's the stuff, Superman. Clubber the crud. There's a womp sound effect in the background as Superman punches Captain Marvel, sending him flying. But we also see in this panel, there's someone who's basically <laughs> cosplaying as the Golden Age Flash, Jay Garrick, mm -hmm. using a colander for a helmet. Yes. It's tremendous. <laughs> I've just had an idea. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there we go. Peter might have guessed what my <laughs> idea is. But yes, this ersatz Jay Garrick is speeding towards Green Arrow, who's thinking, at the moment, I've got my own problems to worry about. Pulls an arrow, fires it at the ground in front of the Flash costumer, thinking, and an oil slick arrow should take care of... Oh no! Of all the dumb, he's skidding towards me! And with a... <clears throat> the fake Flash collides with Green Arrow, sending him flying. Gosh, that's a great panel. This whole page might make it onto the socials. In the first panel of page 19, Superman is in the air, tussling with the fake Captain Marvel, thinking, G.A. and his opponent are both flat on their backs, and there's nothing I can do about it. Big Red is as strong as I am, and neither of us can gain an inch against the other. And in panel two, we see Superman in close-up, facing off against this fake Captain Marvel, who's got a very odd expression on his face. Superman thinks, there must be some way to end this stalemate, but what? And then obviously the captioning helps us out here by saying, Look closely at your adversary's lips, Superman, and you will discover the way. As the red garbed figure mutters an enchantment that was old when the earth was young and draws a bolt of magic energy out of the blackened sky. Yes, there's a massive crash. A Superman is struck by an enormous golden lightning bolt. Wow. Mm. Captain Marvel smiles as Superman falls to the ground. The Man of Steel plummets to earth like a wounded eagle to lie sprawled and unconscious at his companion's side. And the two glowing forms who brought them to this fate fade quietly from sight, leaving an equally mysterious figure standing in their place. Yes, and once again, Phantom Stranger seems to be reaching down and taking something from Green Arrow and Superman. First panel of page 20, we're back with Felix Faust, dramatically underlit, smoke bellowing all around him as he says, All six are down. The mighty Justice League has fallen. And from the ashes of their defeat shall rise the cornerstone of a new empire. The glorious empire of Felix Faust. We cut to Steve Englehart, Jerry Conway and Len Wein walking up a flight of stairs. Presumably in Tom Fagan's house, Len is saying, almost like Glynis vanished. Like she was swallowed up by some malevolent force, Englehart says. You know, you talk just like you write. That's amazing. Jerry Conway chips in with, yeah, come on, man. This is a big house. Your lady could be anywhere. Still plenty of rooms upstairs we haven't checked. One quest continues as another nears its end. Return with us to that quiet Rutland crossroads once again as the witching hour draws nigh. 
and a silent ink-garbed wanderer prepares himself for the urgent task that lies ahead. Yes, we see the Phantom Stranger standing over the unconscious bodies of our Justice League members. How he got them all together, I'm not sure, but hey, this is the Phantom Stranger. This is how he rolls. The caption then for the final panel of page 20 reads... Once more the midnight comes, and the old tower bells mourn its passing with their ringing song. With each clanging note, a name escapes the dark-eyed stranger's lips, and a carefully pilfered possession is thrown to the curling wind. Yes. As the clock starts to chime, the Phantom Stranger throws down Green Lantern's glove, saying, Green Lantern. He throws down a familiar cap with a feather in it, saying, Green Arrow. He throws down a batarang says Batman he throws down a small golden lightning wing and says Flash he throws down a red disc with a hawk emblazoned on it and says Hawkman and he throws down another golden disc taken from Superman's belt and says Superman and as we arrive at top of page 21 the caption there reads at last the clangor dwindles to a sigh, and there is sudden movement at the roadway's edge. Yes, the superheroes all start to wake up, rubbing their heads, coming to their senses. Green Arrow says, what, what happened to us? What's he doing here? He points to the Phantom Stranger in the distance. Batman points at him too and says, You, stranger, I thought you were a friend, but you betrayed us. No, Batman, I saved you from the mystic machinations of Felix Faust. Everyone's got to their feet in panel two. The stranger continues. You had been enchanted, the six of you, by a spell of imminent death. To counteract the spell, I required a personal possession from each of you, but it could not be an item freely given. Since Faust's magic had condemned your demon battle to failure, I devoted my efforts to the ultimate salvation of your lives. And you definitely succeeded, says Hawkman. The stranger continues. With your revival and the regaining of your life energies, Faust's minions cannot remain within their host bodies for long. And as proof of the Phantom Stranger's words... Yes, we see Felix Faust looking at the cosplayers, basically, who had been doing his dirty work. They all seem to be collapsing, and it looks as though golden spectral vapour is leaving each of them. We see Adam Strange on his knees, the, the Commando America guy, paling, Captain Marvel, the big red cheese, and Robin all kneeling, falling over. Felix watches this and says... What? Something's gone wrong! The demons are fleeing the hosts! There is only one possible reason for that. The Justice League of America still lives. And we've seen a final panel of page 21 that he's watching this from a window at Tom Fagan's house. He's standing in the windowsill, the door to this room that he's in bursts open. And Lane Ween, Steve Englehart and Jerry Conway rush in. Faust continues. They'll be coming after me now. Got to get away before... The door slams open. Len Ween says, Mister, don't. Whatever your problem is, there has to be a better way. Jerry Conway says, Please, don't kill yourself. But as the trio lunges forward to stop the intended suicide... Jerry cries, too late, he jumped! And look where he jumped to, says Len, and we see Felix arriving on the roof of... My car! That dude is stealing my car! <laughs> dude, where is my car? <laughs> Indeed. As Felix alights on the roof of Engelhart's battered old motor, he thinks... My magic energies are almost drained. I'd best leave by the most inconspicuous means possible. And so the caption for panel two reads... With the last iota of supernatural strength, the sinister sorcerer jumps the car's ignition and... The car rolls off. Our three writers have made it down to the ground. In panel two, Len cries, We blew it! He's getting away! Muffler and all! Englehart, looking so baldy it's unbelievable, scratches the top of his head and says, My car! My poor freaking car! In the foreground, Jerry looks at his watch and says, Hey, it's 12.02am! What a lousy way to start a new day! And as the dusty old heap rumbles away down the road... Glynis appears in her supergirl costume, rubbing her head, saying... My poor head. What's been going on around here? Glynis, sweetheart, we're looking all over for you, says Len. And then Jerry says... And wearing our feet off, where in blazes have you been? I, I don't know. I just suddenly found myself wandering through that clearing over there. And I could swear I saw a, a battle raging. And the caption for the final panel of page 22 reads... A battle? No. More like a war. As the forces of order and chaos clash on the verdant Vermont countryside with pure pandemonium, the results. Yep, great shot of basically the members of the GLA fighting Felix Faust's demon allies. Flash whirling around a few of them, trapping them all in a whirlwind updraft. Superman punching one out with a crash. Green Arrow knocking one out with a thud. Green Lantern slapping one with a splat. 
Hot Fun and Batman taking a couple out with some blams. And we arrive on page 23 with a caption of the first panel reads. While the nearby Rutland Street, another plan of action has been ventured and lost. Yes, Felix Faust has been pulled up by a couple of policemen. The first one is saying, All right, buddy, pull this museum piece over to the side of the road. And inside the car, Felix thinks, My supernatural powers, totally exhausted. No way to fight back. Only one thing to do. He gets out of the car, in panel two, holding his hands out, saying, OK, officers, I'm yours. Put the cuffs on. I just can't figure out what tipped you off to me. I don't know what you're talking about. You've got a faulty muffler in this thing and we just pulled you over to check it out. In the next panel, Felix is led away by the two cops as the phantom stranger watches. Felix, poor Felix, laughing his head off. <laughs> Caption for panel four. Moments later. We're back. The members of the Justice League flash looking around for the demons and he says, Gone. All of them. And Green Lantern sealed the dimensional portal behind them, says Hawkman. Phantom Stranger is walking towards them all, saying, Gentlemen, it appears you fared well. The Phantom Stranger, just the man we want to see, says a smiling Batman. Superman says to the stranger in the next panel, We've been talking it over among ourselves and, well, we'd like you to join the Justice League. An honest Superman. One I'm not entirely certain I deserve. You let us decide that, pal. We're going to vote on it now says Soups in the caption for the next panel. There is a moment of furious discussion. Yes, and we can see Green Arrow and Green Lantern looking particularly heated. And within seconds... We've decided, says Superman. Phantom Stranger, you are now a member of the... Superman looks around. The Phantom Stranger is nowhere to be seen. Well, can you beat that? He's gone. Didn't even wait around long enough to find out if he made it. Batman concludes things saying... Somehow I think he knows Superman, and that we'll see him again. If ever we need him. That's essentially the end. The caption reads, Next issue, the shaggy man will get you if you don't watch out. Worth to live by, we're told that the next issue's on sale only about December the 5th. Well then. Poor Felix. <laughs> Poor Len and Glynis having a horrible time. I love the... F now, we should quickly, just before it's all fresh in their minds, mm -hmm. Felix ran off in the car and just has just scared Loki over a cliff. Yes. <laughs> well, this has been going on. Listen, we said this earlier on. I think we might try on Facebook and put the whole thing as far as the Glynis. We might try this. Try and put the Glynis and Len stuff all into chronological order. order using the panels from the three cop. We might. Don't, might. don't yeah. shout at us if uh -huh. we don't. Mm -hmm. But it'd be a lot of fun if you had the stories yourself, just having them all out simultaneously and just reading all the comics in front of you, just reading through these bits and seeing it all maps out. It's absolutely glorious, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Without a doubt, yes. So much fun. So we, much fun. I think, I think we got there. Oof. Another one, listeners, where I'm sick of the sound of my own voice, quite frankly. <laughs> and I got to do some overacting. Yes. Tony's going to love that. Well, that was good. I got to do The Phantom Stranger. I've been waiting for years to play The Phantom Stranger. Fantastic. I love The Phantom Stranger, do don't you, you have, mate? Do you have a complete run of Phantom Stranger comics, David? Yes. Well, I'm not sure, actually. I've got a full run of the original... Not, well, not the original 50s mm. one. I've got the Bronze Age equivalent, the one that's going on at this point. I've got a full run of those. I got issue four, and it was like the first, maybe only time I went up to visit my sister when she was at uni in Aberdeen. I got that. And I, would that have been Plan 9? Yeah. Was that the Aberdeen comic shop yeah, at that point? I, I can't remember. I, so. I remember just being delighted that randomly they had issue four of Phantom Stranger in the mall. <laughs> I think I've got every issue of the new 52 series, but I read the first few issues of that when it was coming out, and I was kind of like... Mm, yeah. I'm not sure what, about all this actually mm -hmm. but I might I think I've got more or less everything yeah I love the Phantom Stranger he's so cool you've got so much you didn't even have to buy that Phantom Stranger Omnibus yes. when it came out that Phantom Stranger Omnibus that just came out which is missing the world's finest story when <gasps> Soups and Bats and the Phantom Stranger team up because well actually Bats and Soups one of them's been turned into a vampire I can't remember which one <laughs> but it's a great Omnibus it's an absolute bargain for the money yes this podcast has been brought to you by DC Comics Omnibuses Limited so let's talk about the comics that we've just done then Peter Gosh. 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 <laughs> Where do we start? Wasn't it nice to, the, to have a member of the X-Men and Thor just drop past briefly? <laughs> it's ridiculous. This was so much fun. I really hugely enjoyed it. It's. I wonder if people knew about the other comics when they were picking them up. Obviously, the Marvel ones related to each other and told you, uh -huh. you know, yeah, see this yeah, other yeah. issue. Yeah, they're a bit more closely linked together, yeah, aren't they? Uh -huh. But the DC one, this Justice League we've just read, 
it does tie in a lot with it. Yeah. But you can you can read all three as a standalone. That's yeah. the thing. Yeah. That's, I mean, as, as we've said, yeah, you can read that. read all three of them in whatever order you like and you get the full gist. I mean, what's mm-hmm. nice is that the Justice League story shows the muffler falling off and shows who <laughs> stole Steve's car. Yeah. Whereas Amazing Adventures just has them complaining about the muffler having fallen off and mm-hmm. Thor has them talking about someone stealing the car, but yeah. we don't actually see who it is. Uh-huh. Those aspects of it, Joyce, I can just imagine them all, you know, Jerry and Len and Steve just sat about planning, going, right, well, you could do this here and I'll do yeah. that. And it's the way it all falls together <laughs> is glorious. I remember reading JLA a long time ago, this JLA story a long, long time ago, mm-hmm. and then reading Amazing Adventures quite a long time after that. I probably would have read Amazing Adventures run about, I think, circa 2013, 2014, when I sure. first started listening to The Danger Room. Okay. Because I got a hold of the masterworks that reprinted mm-hmm. the, the Hank McCoy stories mm-hmm. and had a lingering sort of feeling there that, wait a minute, does that, that seems vaguely familiar somehow. Yeah. And I was probably thinking of the Justice League story, you know, the, okay. them yeah. making their way to this place for the parade. And obviously, you know, there's been a fair amount of coverage over the years of the Halloween Rutland Parade, be it online uh-huh. or in other magazines and stuff. Yeah. So it's it was nice to, for the first time, actually, to read all three of them one after the other and get the gist of it all going on. Yeah. It was delightful. Absolutely delightful. In relation to this story in particular, as much as I love the glorious mid-story splash panel with them all in the power-ringed floats, yes, and they're all waving, which I think is amazing, as much as I love that, I've got one major nitpick with it, right? and that's Flash is standing on it wearing his yellow boots. Now, as we know... <laughs> that's the most Peter Watson <laughs> thing ever, but you're right. As you're we right. know, uh, Green Lantern's right. power ring is ineffective and anything yellow, which means Flash yes. should basically fall through it. Unless, unless, I can, I'm going to no prize this and give a reason for it, unless Flash has muddied up the soles of his boots so he can stand on the power ring float. I'm going to say that's the case. Yes. <laughs> I think it has to be. I think actually Dick Dillon preempted the fact that you were going to say that because he's drawn a man at the bottom of page nine who's mm-hmm. looking at you. <laughs> who looks he looks a bit like Ralph Dibley, he does actually. a bit doesn't he yeah. his nose must be twitching thinking hang on this page isn't right he's thinking hang on how can Barry be standing on that power ring float see one of these things that occasionally every now and then to remember and you get Barry standing in a power ring construct but he's holding his boots yes. which I love I, I love that's, yes that's, this little touch is that it's not even referenced, but literally he's... Or he's sat that. down so uh-huh. off, off the edge so that his yeah. feet are, are dangling. Yeah. But in this one, although it's a it's a great, fantastic image, but it's, it did just make me go, oh! <laughs> <laughs> it made you go, what? Ah! Oh, Interesting. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> Listeners, what noise did you make when you saw the flash standing on that power ring generated float? I just kind of didn't even register it, to be honest. Oh, I'm a bad fan. Gasp. The thing I want to talk about quickly before I forget is um, Batman's familiarity with Spider-Man. Yeah, we did for the sake of experience. We summarised some of the fights and stuff, mm-hmm. listeners. But there is a point when Batman tackles the the Peter Parker cosplayer and thinks to himself, "This bargain basement web slinger has all the powers of the real thing." And that was pretty cool because mm-hmm. at this point, obviously, Batman and Spidey hadn't officially met, unless it was an, an issue of the Inferior Five, and I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, but as we know, that's its own universe, so that's fine. Yes, it's, I mean, and it's really funny looking at the cosplayers because obviously the guy that's dressed as Spidey, he's obviously quite. Um, He's not as not as fit as the real thing either. It's like what you sort of said about Adam Strange looking a bit saggy and baggy. Yeah, that's the thing. All these costumes look as if they were properly homemade. You yes, know, at the time, it's not like professional cosplayers these days, but everything has to be absolutely custom and perfect looking. It, yeah, it's back before the word cosplay existed. Exactly, it's dressing exactly. up. It was dressing up as we used to call it when we were when we were younger. Or fancy dress. Yeah, one of the two. I mean, yeah. I love the fact that the G. Garrett guy is obviously just wearing like a red shirt and the, his yellow yeah. thunderbolt has been sewn on. He's wearing red jeans. Yeah, but he's got a colander. It's clearly a colander <laughs> that he's using his helmet. That's of course it's wonderful. That's genius. It's and more like the thinker's helmet, really. Exactly. <laughs> and we should talk about Superman fighting this fake Captain Marvel and yep. the bit where um. Look closely at your adversary's lips, Superman. You will discover the way as the red garbed figure mutters an enchantment that was old when the earth was young. Mm-hmm. And draws. He's basically said Shazam so that Superman is struck by the magical lightning. Now, I remember a lot of discourse about this sort mm-hmm. of thing in the past. People try to say Kingdom Come was the first time it happened. Yeah. And someone else saying it happens in the Superman Shazam tabloid, which right. we'll get to eventually. But uh-huh. I'm pretty sure that must be the first. It's not the real Captain is, Marvel. Yeah. Uh-huh. But that's definitely what's happening there, isn't it? Well, this is the first time they've confronted each other in exactly. any way, shape or form. So, yes, without and, a doubt. And as, as doubt. Batman says, the Spider-Man guy had the powers. The Flash mm-hmm. guy was running very quickly. Adam Strange was bombing about with a ray gun. Commando America had Steve Rogers' skill with the shield. Yep. To all intents and purposes, this guy probably had was powered in the same way as you know yep. as the real Captain Marvel. Mm-hmm. So yes, everything you know is wrong, listeners. Yes, another myth shattered by the Earth Two podcast. Absolutely you are welcome. 
that's another panel that I'm sure I've seen taken out of context elsewhere, and it's again, yeah. you know, Supes fighting this, fighting this version of Cap. All very exciting. We should also very quickly, again, this is, listeners, I don't make notes, I just do it off the top of my head. Peter's a bit more prepared, but I loved the league assembling at the start of this mm-hmm. and Hawkman's lineup. Since the other members are still on Earth 2, helping the Seven Soldiers of Victory adjust to the world of the present. So that's almost enough justification for us to do this comic yeah. on its own. I want to read that story. Me too. About I saying, want, here's yeah. what's happened in the last couple of decades. Yeah. yeah. I want to see Zatanna and Metamorpho and Black Canary and Atom and Aquaman. Because mm-hmm. I think, judging by who's missing, that's must, who it all must have been. <laughs> and Ralph, the aforementioned Ralph, yep. didn't he? Not, mm-hmm. quite a full, not quite a full member at this point. Uh-huh. I want to see them all kind of showing them how credit cards work or... <laughs> <laughs> you know what? What, what, thing? what telling eight ex- tracks? Yeah, it's, it's explaining tracks. to the Shining Knight who the Beatles are. <laughs> They'd have to like open up one of these comics and go through all the list of the music on mm. the eight track page. That's right. To see what albums it you can order for three dollars. Suggest which twelve albums that Vigilante <laughs> could pick so he could get up to speed with what's been what's been happening in music while he's been mm-hmm. out of things. That's a nice little throwback continuity thing, which kind of yeah. ties in with the. I mean. JLA is almost serialised at this point. You know, every mm-hmm. most issues flow into the other ones yeah. very, very well. Obviously, we did JLA 106 recently. We didn't. We talked briefly there about how issue 105 had kind of flowed into it. This one, this mm-hmm. is a, a nice little callback. Obviously, JLA 102 finished with the caption for A Stranger Walks Among Us. Yeah. And I wonder, I wonder how much time had passed. Because yeah. obviously, we're at Halloween. So, you mm-hmm. know, did those stories come out? 100 to 102 came out during the summer. So, was, was Aquaman on Earth 2 and was the Atom on Earth 2 for a while? Were they there for a couple of months? I don't know. It's Humans. interesting to think about, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, there's a specific date given for those no. stories, even though they came out in the summer. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. One thing I found interesting was Mistress Sarah. She's got horror host written all over her. Where's her horror comic? Maybe when we write our DC comic. Mm, could be. She could do the House of Shudder, as we mentioned in Supergirl issue five. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Oh, God, of course. <laughs> it writes itself, doesn't it? It listeners? does indeed. Mistress Sarah. We should probably talk a little bit about the two Marvel comics that we touched on. Any thoughts from those? I love the Beast and Juggernaut's fight. That's fantastic. The fact, obviously, they had you know previously met and encountered. But of the course. Beast, but the Beast has got his new form and looks different. And the whole the aging of the Juggernaut, and it was horrible as yeah. well. See, when his helmet was off and he's got that aged face and he's, and he's missing some horrible, teeth and all that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, you, can, you can see the fear in his face. It's, it's genuinely chilling. Uh-huh. I think the first time I read the Juggernaut was oh, there must have been an X-Men reprint or, a, or that time when he fought Spider-Man. Hmm. I mean, I, I love this version of the Beast. Yes, yes. I remember being, you know, first encountering, I was a member of the, the Avengers, obviously. Mm-hmm. And then at some point in the early 80s, seeing some kind of Marvel UK reprint um, and seeing the original X-Men, I think it might be in a Fantastic Four annual, I think that reprinted a, an X-Men Fantastic Four story. But also there was, a, I don't know if you remember, there was a Marvel house ad which was Mm -hmm. promoting the all new different X-Men at the same time I think Amazing Adventures was revived for reprints of the original right? and I think that was when I finally, it finally dawned on me that this non-furry blue beast guy with the big hands and the big feet was the same guy who'd been hopping about in the pages of Avengers and Marvel team up and since I made that connection I've always loved that way that Hank McCoy was sort of rebooted and reformatted, I think it's one of the best ever character Mm -hmm. alterations yeah. Without really without losing any of the intent. I mean the Hulk obviously changed colours at various points yeah. here and there and Steve Rogers has different uniforms and outfits at points. But the fact that, you know, the beast evolved in this way, I mean yeah. it, it knocks the Sandman suddenly wearing yellow and purple into a tin hat, really, doesn't it? Yeah, it certainly does. Remember that period in the late eighties where pretty much all the main Marvel characters Changed their looks because they had that lineup that they use as an advert. Of course, that's right. Because Steve Rogers became the captain and had the different thing. Thor had these different armor. He his armor. Hulk was grey. And yeah, Prince Iron Man had the Silver Centurion. Spidey had a black costume. Yeah, yeah. They all changed their looks. It's interesting. So yeah, that was very a interesting. Fun time, fun time. But yeah, this uh, preceded them all. Oh, ah, absolutely. Mm. Not as much to say about the Thor one, really, because we kind of skimmed over an awful lot of the details, but. Mm-hmm. It's interesting seeing the float and seeing how you know that's got the guy in the Thor costume and yeah. the guy in the Spider-Man costume and the Captain America costume and they could maybe be the same ones that mm-hmm. fought the others. My Thor knowledge is not what it could be by any stretch of the imagination. Mm-hmm. I wonder how long it was before Loki came back after falling off that cliff, blinded. He probably just stood up, dusted himself off and walked away. Yes, <laughs> being yes. the god that he is. Root or fell yeah. through something. Left a Loki-shaped hole in the ravine floor. We do have a plan to return to Thor at some point in the podcast. Mm-hmm. There's a Loki story that Peter's been nagging me to to cover at the same time so Loki and Thor will return eventually 
if you're remotely interested in such things. Yes. I thought it was quite cool that it was uh, two major magicians from Marvel and DC who were like behind all the shenanigans. You know, Loki and Felix Faust. Yep. Great fun stuff. I bet that was planned. I mean, we mm-hmm. could have had another comic somewhere else where they both teamed up loosely. You yep. know, Loki could have had a different uniform because it's not as if the name could be trademarked particularly. Yeah, true. It's interesting noticing the, the waxing and waning of Steve Englehart's hair across the three comics. <laughs> it's, yeah. He looks a bit like Tom Petty in the, the Amazing Adventure story, but it's a complete scullet that he's got by the time of Just League of yeah. America. So maybe he had more pals at Marvel to draw him in a more flattering way than than the two dicks managed in JLA. Yeah. Party in the back, Baldy in the front. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Just buy some clippers, Mr. Englehart. You'll get much more respect for it. Yes. There's no need to have the riffraff no. from Rocky Horror look. No. Absolutely not. So we'll jump ahead now to the JLA mailroom from issue 106 of Justice League of America. And the first letter says, Dear Editor, in A Stranger Walks Among Us, Len Wein scripted a fine tale that succeeds not so much on the basis of the plot, but rather on the extras. To be specific, there is the heating feud between Green Arrow and Hawkman. Len handled it well, not overdoing the animosity, letting it build naturally. The appearance and disappearance of the Phantom Stranger preserved the something special air that hangs about the Justice Society stories. The continuity was further strengthened by Hawkman's reference to the previous goings-on. Len and Glynis Ween pop up in one of Len's own stories, something straight out of Jorge Luis Borges, and handled well indeed. Of course, oohs and ahs must have spilled out as readers gandered at the Marvel lookalikes and their shenanigans, and that's from David Dash, Brooklyn, New York. There's no editorial response for that. Boo! I hate it when there's no editorial response. But the next letter is from a familiar name. Uh-huh. Uh-oh. Dear editor, that Len Wein does have a way of surprising me. You see, when I saw that the Phantom Stranger was guest standing in JLA 103, I was prepared for the kind of fare Len gives us in P.S.'s own mag. Namely, long monologues that retard whatever value the plot may have. Harsh. But not this time. Nope. P.S. managed to retain all his mystic dignity and keep his speeches to a minimum at the same time. Good. The plot itself was pretty standard. Evil magician releases demons to take over human bodies. But what made it such a good issue were the added touches. The fight scenes, for instance, with your own heroes, the Big Red Cheese and Commando America. The obligatory appearances by the required amount of prose and when small dashes of personality flash calling Hawkman Catter, after all that is his name, Hawkman's and Green Arrow's running feuds, I'm all on HM's side, Gosh. the Batman mentioning Robin's punning, and most of all, Faust being caught by Steve's ancient car. And that's from none other than Mike W. Barr, gosh, from Akron, Ohio. Mike, of course, will write a Phantom Stranger story in his Batman and the Outsiders run. Of course. Yay. No editorial response again, and the next letter says, Dear Editor, Absolutely loved it. References to real people and a comics. Oh dear. Mag, especially if I happen to know them, tend to enliven any story in my estimation, and JLA 103 was chock full of them. Guest appearances by author Len Wein and company, as well as a few rival superheroes, combine neatly with the Halloween atmosphere to make this issue a lot of fun. Since I was more interested in following the exploits of the guests at the party than the efforts of our stalwart heroes to escape the evil clutches of Felix Faust, I haven't much to say about the plot. Merely that I had so much fun reading the ish that I didn't care about finding or following or criticising a storyline. Well, we should check out Flash's Yellow Boots. A few words in praise of Len Wein are in order, though. It has been said before, but it's worth repeating, he has captured the feeling of the Justice League of America. He has a knack for throwing in little touches that no one would miss if they were absent, but that add so much to a story when they are present. The Hawkman Green Arrow feud. The irony of Faust's arrest. Steve's telling Len that he talks just like he writes. And that's from Susan Bregman from Providence, Rhode Island. Once again, we do not get an editorial response, which is interesting, but I would love to be able to say to Susan, Susan, if you're more concerned about the other guests at the party, go and read Thor issue 207 and Amazing (laughs) Adventures issue 16 for a bit more detail. The final letter in JLA 106 reads, Dear Editor, The December JLA 103 left this reader with mixed emotions. Ah, the 1989 smash hit single by the Rolling Stones. I wonder if Mick Jagger read issue 106 of JLA. Possibly. Listeners, write in and let us know. Overall, overall, Claxon, uh, I would have to say that I didn't enjoy A Stranger Walks Among Us. Gasp. It had its good points, along with its overwhelming bad ones. Oh dear. I know. The appearance of the Phantom Stranger would have been welcomed if it weren't for the below par story. <gasps> First, this tale was a complete farce. When any writer attempts to caricature himself and his friends, it almost always spells disaster. 
The escape and capture of the villainous and malevolent Felix Faust was downright silly. He almost captured the Justice Leaguers and yet was so easy to capture. The thing that bugged me most was that bit with Adam Strange. No one on earth except the JLA knows Adam Strange is a hero on another world. The good things were the slight antagonism between Green Arrow and Hawkman, the Phantom Stranger's implied membership and the wonderfully descriptive captions. And that's from our old pal James T. McCoy, Jr., Valley Station, Kentucky. Phantom Stranger's implied membership, that's something that often gets debated, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. As far as I'm concerned, he's not. He doesn't have a signal device. He didn't accept. You know, he just turns up occasionally when it suits him and when it's the right thing to do. I think a lot of it comes from him being, I've read this quite recently, it comes from him being included in a poster or illustration of the mm. inter- interior of the satellite or something and him being one of the bodies that's yeah. that's there. I don't know, I kind of half count him because the first time I encountered him, he was it was in an issue of JLA, that I'm sure. You know, I think I said this earlier on, like the, the one with the Atom's Wedding. The mm-hmm. one with the Atom's Wedding. What if issues of the Justice League were named after episodes of Friends? It's a weird one. I mean, he's not like... He pops up in issue... Does he pop up in issue 200? Yes. See? But everyone pops up in issue 200. Uh, well, does Adam Strange and Metamorpho pop up in issue 200? I think Adam Strange gets mentioned anyway. Metamorpho, no. I don't know. I think he's one of these guys, as you say, though. He's, he's kind of around when he's needed. Mm-hmm. And I think that's probably enough. I love the idea of him being a, a regular member. Just sort of sat there, you know, round the meeting table or having an argument with the Flash or something or just being inscrutable all the time. Or he's the chairperson of the month, know. you know. <laughs> just go, oh. Now, listeners, I've quickly dug out the letters page that's applicable to Thor 207, but disappointingly, there's nothing really specific about any of the, the crossover plots. Although there's one very, very, very positive letter that reads, Dear Stan, Roy, Jerry and John, there are times when silence speaks much louder than words. In the case of Thor 207 featuring the Halloween story Fire Sword, there is no possible way I can elaborate on it. No way at all. And so, in the words of George Carlin, Hey man, que pasa? I bring this letter to a close. And that brief epistle is from R.J. Bedard, Windsor, Ontario. Mm. So that's quite funny. <laughs> and listeners, having had a quick look through my extensive Amazing Adventures collection, I haven't been able to find any letters that deal with um, this particular Hank McCoy adventure, but of course... At that point, Amazing Adventures had shifted over to the adventures of Kill Raven. Gosh. How amazing. Mm-hmm. So you're probably worried about other things. So that concludes our visit to the Rutland Halloween Parade. The Rutland Parade would turn up in quite a few other comics over the years, ranging from DC superstars to Superboy to Generation X. And indeed, some of those stories might well pop up on the podcast in the future, so stay tuned for those. But what did you think of Amazing Adventures Issue 16, Thor 207 and Just League 103, listeners. Well, you can write in and let us know. You can email us at the Earth 2 podcast at gmail.com or you can even leave us a message at speakpipe.com forward slash the Earth 2 podcast and tell us with your own voice or a fake voice if you want to do yeah, so. Yeah, or get someone else to read out your message as if they were maybe being held hostage. Yes. That, Try it. That'd be good. Generally works for me, yeah. I think so. Make sure you check out our socials because there'll be lots of lovely bonus material going up for this and indeed every episode so on Facebook and Instagram or at the Earth 2 Podcast and at Twitter at podcast underscore Earth 2 and it's the number two for all our social media. Yep, check out Facebook and Instagram this week because I've managed to, as well as finding a couple of foreign reprints of JLA 103, I've managed to find a few foreign reprints of Thor 207. Gosh. I know, I know. That's so, a treat. Yep, check those out and... Bear with us and don't shout at us too hard if we don't manage to stick all of the Steve and Len <laughs> scenes into it. Maybe I'll just, I, maybe I'll, I'll attempt it. <laughs> maybe I'll do it. Maybe I'll try it. On that bombshell. Yeah. I've been Peter. And I've been David. Happy Halloween, listeners. Indeed. And we hope you're enjoying this spooky festive season not long till Christmas. How exciting. Mm-hmm. Take care. We'll see you soon on The Earth, Earth 2, 2 Podcast. Podcast. Transmatter cube activated. Return coordinates set for Earth Prime!